the metropolis of today, New York City, 1940. A blend of buildings and streets in familiar colors, familiar patterns, familiar forms. Here are the materials we have used for years, architectural forms to which we are accustomed, life as we know it and live it today. Our camera sweeps the horizon, turning in the direction of a new world that symbolizes man's dreams, prophecies, hopes, and aspirations. In the distance, we see it shining white in the sunlight with its giant trilon and perisphere rising to the sky to silently voice the peaceful projections of mankind. The New York World's Fair of 1940. So vast is this second edition of the world's greatest fair that you and I could spend two weeks in just walking through all the exhibits without pausing to examine them in detail. But let us skim the surface for a few moments, feel some of its excitement, color, and human interest, see some of its new marvels revealed for the first time and examine in some detail one of its most beautiful buildings. Here, literally, is the greatest show on earth, this year bigger and better than ever, and through these gates come visitors from all over the world. Crowds, they're what make a fair a fair, and here on Flushing Meadows is everything a crowd loves, bands, gay flags, picturesque costumes and folk dances, color and movement, and never a dull moment. The 1940 World's Fair is dedicated to the twin ideals of peace and freedom. Probably no figure symbolizes these ideals better than that of George Washington. It wouldn't be a World's Fair without the participation of other countries. Here are the exhibits of many nations displayed in a haven of peace. Visitors may step into these buildings and view foreign art, industry, craftsmanship and culture, pridefully contrived and beautifully displayed. The United States government, in its own beautiful building, gives an account of its stewardship, and the states have their own displays, dramatizing their attractions, their products, their history, and their progress. On every side is the beautiful and the strange, man-made waterfalls designed as an integral part of buildings, thundering in an incredible cascade, fountains leaping and dancing in the sun, flowers and lovely landscaping, unsuspected angles and vistas, a paradise for the camera fan. There's so much to see and wonder at, now and then we simply have to stop for rest and refreshment. Ah, that's an idea. Even in the midst of all these wonders, Mrs. Elmer and the children must have their ice cream cones. For the real key to what the future holds for us, look to the exhibits of industry and trade. For here are the forms and patterns of the new day, the fascinating new materials that are being introduced, the advances in technology, the things that will affect the way we dress, eat, work, play, travel, and live. Here are the advances in metals and plastics, the drama of progress in electricity, gas, oil, rubber, glass, the new materials for the building of homes, the new in-home furnishings and housekeeping, the improvements in communication and transportation, the authentic forecasts of life as we will come to know it. In the transportation zone, visitors find one of the most beautiful, certainly one of the most dynamic, and according to attendance records, one of the most popular industrial buildings in the fair, the Ford Exposition Building. Newly designed for 1940, the Ford Building, together with its gardens, covers seven acres. It is strikingly modern in design and full of action. To the left of the front entrance, is a huge statue of the mythical god Mercury, symbolizing fleet, effortless travel. The main entrance hall is a symphony in color and a fascinating introduction to what follows. Here is a panorama of the motor car age, starting with the first Ford car, built in 1903, and coming down to the present Ford, the Lux Ford, Mercury, Lincoln Zephyr, and Lincoln, style leaders for the road of tomorrow. Visitors pause long before Henry Ford's first gasoline engine and marvel at the huge mobile mural by Henry Billings, the first moving mural in the world, symbolizing the dependence of industry upon pure science. From 10 in the morning until 10 at night, the industrial hall is a scene of activity with crowds thronging around the manufacturing exhibits. And dominating this scene is the central exhibit the Ford Cycle of Production. A giant turntable, 100 feet in diameter, 
weighing 152 tons and floated in 20,000 gallons of water. Here, dramatized by delightful activated models, is a story of how the automobile industry spreads employment back through its suppliers, back to the raw materials and the millions engaged in their production. 27 typical raw materials are traced through their processing stages to the finished parts of a Ford car. With the cycle of production as a background, other exhibits show actual operations. The casting of molten iron, the growing use of farm products in industry, with a demonstration of soybean processing and the making of plastic, and a dramatic contrasting of handwork and machine work. This exhibit shows that the Ford car, if made by hand, would cost about $17,000 while machinery makes cars at prices people can pay and creates millions of jobs as a result. These are just a few of the highlights in this fascinating industrial hall. Directly off this hall is the new Ford Theater, where seated in cushioned, air-conditioned comfort, visitors witness a veritable three-star production, a ballet fantasy called A Thousand Times Nay, in which a talking horse takes the feature comedy role a gala style show that combines the latest in fashions with the newest in motor car designs, and a full-length technicolor motion picture titled Symphony in F, wherein the figures of the cycle of production come to life and tell an interesting tale. From the industrial hall, visitors stream into the garden court and onto the loading platform for a thrilling ride on the road of tomorrow, a dream highway of the future built as a part of the Ford Exposition Building. In brightly colored Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln Zephyr cars, visitors are driven around this road of the future for more than half a mile. Up the spiral ramp, showing how traffic can be lifted to the express level without wasting space. Around and through the building itself. The Ford Building is on the highest point of land in the fairgrounds, and the view of the fair from the road is one of the best. No cross traffic complete separation of opposing streams of traffic, the road of tomorrow. In the landscape garden court, visitors are invited to rest and relax and listen to the music of the New World Ensemble under the direction of the famous composer, Ferdy Grofe. Using the latest type of electronic instruments, Mr. Grofe creates novel and interesting musical effects. Throughout every foot of this colorful, dramatic, and beautiful 1940 New York World's Fair, we find inspiration for new ideas and the grounds for renewed faith in the future. Inspiration and faith that are truly needed by every individual today. And it wouldn't be a World's Fair without an amusement section. On the Great White Way, there's fun for young and old. Here are new ways to enjoy yourself. New 1940 thrills and excitements. Here's a parachute jump, not for daredevils, but for all of us to try. Music. Games, excitement, some walk and some ride. Everybody buys souvenirs and everybody eats, whether it's a packaged lunch or a full meal in one of the many restaurants. And when the day gives way to night, the pageant of beauty starts all over again in a different way. For the march of science has brought new brilliance in lighting, new panoramas of color to delight the eye. And then, of course, the fireworks, beauty, Action, color, drama, the greatest show on earth, the 1940 World's Fair. <laughs>